But we still have like one minute. So let's give people this one more minute. Let's see, there are 11 people. I actually have a bit of a icebreaker, you know, while we are waiting. You know, yeah. if people want to uh, uh, yeah. they are. use this poll, you know, I'm just going to paste the link for this uh, for those who um, have access to a smartphone, which is pretty much everyone these days. Uh, you should be able to use the QR code as well. Um, and I'm moving between Teams and Zoom, so I'm kind of struggling to see where the icons are. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Check. Um, okay, so. So it is. The... Yeah, it's 5 30 uh, here local time, and it's just during the lunch break for Joe, 12 30 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, and I welcome everyone to the last session of today, uh, last but very, very interesting uh, systemic thinking, uh, which I have high expectations really to help us <laughs> learn something more about uh, how to deal with complexities in a better way. Well, Joe, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Anna. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, so um, uh, while we wait a couple of minutes for people to join, I thought, you know, I'll just uh, have some kind of an icebreaker here. Um, so I've pasted a link in the chat on Zoom. Um, so if you guys can go to that poll EV link um, and it should bring up um, a poll that is, you can do that on your smartphone as well. So I just wanted to, get a sense check of how people are feeling. Number one, uh, I'll activate that right now. So you should be able to see that. Um, you guys able to do that? Can you give me a thumbs up or something to indicate on chat? Are you able to get to the poll? Yes. Hey, I can already start seeing the results. So awesome. It's fantastic. Hopeful, excited. Tomorrow. So looking forward to tomorrow, I guess. Yeah. Accomplished. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. So still, I think good vibes overall. Okay. So let me move to the next poll. You know, just curious uh, where you are like to know where you're joining from. So if you can just touch the spot in the map where you're joining from presently. I can see a couple from the West Coast. I mean, majority from the West Coast of the US. Yes, so someone's asking for the poll link. So let me just paste it once again. Yeah. Awesome, guys. I don't think we should spend any more time on the poll. It's good to see um, all of you. And so we will get started with um, some amount of content to cover. So let's look at what the agenda looks like so overall. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of flexible. You know, the intro session is itself, you know, it's going to be kind of a lengthy intro. It's not just about intro about myself. It's also a little bit more about the, the subject matter that we're going to talk about. And we will do a priming exercise. Uh, we will do some systems mapping. You will have some homework and some takeaways and next steps uh, for learning, okay? Uh, if that sounds good, uh, let me just move these things away from my screen and get started. Uh, maybe a little bit of a background about myself. I'm Joe Anthony, uh, some of you already know me, and I've been part of a number of uh, uh, lead alumni initiatives. 
um, such as Capstone Project and uh, Lisa before this. And then this is my new initiative, which is systems thinking, which I'm very passionate about. Um, so in my, uh, my day job as a senior enterprise coach, I've worked for a bank called Commonwealth Bank, and uh, which is a, the largest bank in Australia and probably one of the largest in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, my role is basically as a transformation coach. Um, so what I do is to bridge the gap between the strategy and the actual mobilization of uh, that strategy, the transformation strategy uh, in any organization. So before CBA, I did similar roles with other large corporations within Australia and internationally as well. Um, so I'm a big um, uh, advocate of creating enterprise ecosystems, um, ecosystems for innovation and um, uh, learning, uh, and uh, you know, and and I believe that's a great way to embed changes and transformation in culture, technology, and, and you know, operating models, business models, and so forth. Um, in order for me to do this, you know, I leverage quite a bit on systems thinking, the approaches that I'm about to teach as part of this uh, session. Um, and uh, the reason why uh, this is uh, fantastic is because, you know, it allows us to tap into the collective wisdom of people uh, who are involved and who uh, have deep insights on, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, uh, their perspectives are invaluable to actually embed change effectively uh, in, in large organizations. So, and that's probably why, uh, you know, I moved towards systems thinking in the first place. So that's enough about me. Um, I'll just quickly move over to uh, systems thinking. You know, what is, let me just put my phone on silence. Um, so. Okay. Um, what is systems thinking? So systems thinking at a very broad level, I would say it's a way of uh, thinking about the world as a, as a very interconnected collective whole, rather than thinking about it uh, in discrete parts, okay? So it's a very broad generic definition. You know, we'll go into much more than once, um, more um, applicable and practical definitions of systems thinking uh, as we go through this uh, presentation and workshop. Uh, but for now, you know, um, this is what systems thinking is. And I, I thought I should also talk a little bit about my own, um, the evolution of my own understanding of what systems thinking is. And um, uh, to me, this whole journey started about six, seven years ago. Um, I was part of a large transformation program, you know, which completely went pear shaped. And, you know, so, you um, it, it, you know, I think hundreds of millions of dollars were spent with very little to show for it um, in terms of outcomes um, by a large organization, not my current one. Um, so, uh, the, and that kind of led me on a quest uh, to really understand what went wrong there. Oh, so sorry about this. Apologies. Um, so the uh, realization uh, for me from that initiative was that uh, we often miss the big picture. You know, um, we we don't see the the full picture uh, very much. You know, people involved in large initiatives. Um, don't share a, when they don't share a, uh, a common mindset and mental model and a shared vision of what they're trying to achieve. Uh, things, you know, no matter what happens, no matter how good your project management is, no matter how many innovations uh, that teams and people come up with, um, you know, in isolation, they don't translate to a collective outcome effectively. Okay, so that's what actually. Uh, you know, kind of attracted me towards a big picture thinking and methodologies that are, um, you know, uh, leaning more towards that big picture thinking. So that's how, uh, you know, my venture into systems thinking started. Uh, but then there was no real concrete way to apply systems thinking, right? So back then when I was looking at it, you know, the, the terrain was 
uh, you know, as described by uh, this guy called um, uh, Brian Castellini, uh, he, 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 uh, he uh, produces this map of what the complexity, the world of complexity science looks like. And this was his view in circa 2015. So as you can see, there is nothing in here which says, hey, this is systems thinking, right? So systems thinking is a generic concept. Like I said, it's more about thinking about the world as a connected whole, but then there are many nuanced ways in which you can do that. And there are many areas of applications and because of which there are many different subcultures within systems thinking uh, or disciplines, I would say. So as you can see here, you know, there's complexity science, there's cybernetics, there's systems theory, there's dynamic systems theory. All of this, um, you know, made it, you know, very interesting for me to go through each one, but then, you know, how do you bring it together and solve some practical problems in real world organization? You know, that's what um, led me to kind of explore even further, but then I got distracted, you know, I didn't, I thought it's kind of futile to, to pay attention or, you know, to dive deeper into system thinking, you know, I, I, it was kind of, you know, I went in there. Uh, it was more of a background activity for me and in you know, a foreground, you know, I was focusing more on other ways of, uh, you know, agility, systems thinking, business agility, innovation, you know, so that's, that kind of was in the foreground for me. Um, and then I, again, you know, this realization started coming that there needs to be something that brings it all together, right, you know, so how do you you know, ensure that we don't lose sight of the big picture. Again, you know, multiple experiences led me to that. And when I looked again at 2000, in 2018, the same guy, Brian Castellini, published another map of systems thinking, and it looked even more horrendous than before. <laughs> you know, there's, it's, it's, it's fantastic, you know, don't get me wrong, I really appreciate the effort that has gone into this. But then, you know, if you really need to uh, be able to apply systems thinking, you know, where do I start? You know, where do I, uh, you know, how do I start uh, adapt, adapting or uh, adopting this to my work, right? So that's, that was my challenge. And again, in 2021, it looks like this. I can only imagine when he releases the version of his map in 2022 and beyond, you know, how much more denser, how much more he can squeeze uh, in this space. Um, so I was a bit, um, you know, frustrated by not being able to find a method uh, until uh, I stumbled on something called as the soft systems methodology. Okay, so this, this is a methodology that came about um, in the 70s, you know, but not too much of traction yet, you know, that it deserves, but it's a methodology that was introduced by a guy called Peter Checkland. Um, and um, so, the approach that they were following is quite different from a lot of the systems thinking approaches that are out there. Um, so essentially, um, the worldview on systems thinking is kind of split along the lines, you know, from where I stand today, um, between hard systems view and soft systems view. Okay, so I'm just going to call out what the key differences are. Uh, in the hard systems view, um, you know, it takes the perspective that real world is real, obviously, you know, but soft systems view uh, takes a bit more nuanced perspective that real world is not as real and solid as you think, right? What we think as real world is, is not as solid uh, as what uh, is generally, uh, you know, uh, our traditional way of uh, thinking and understanding the world is not um, that, you know, the real world is not solid, right? We think that we live in a really solid world and you know, things are very deterministic. Um, the hard systems view um, also talks about problems um, yeah, as if it can be fully defined to an extent. It could be hard, but it can be done. But soft systems view, um, takes a view that, you know, problems, defining problem is itself problematic. The reason for that is 
because of, you know, there are many nuanced perspectives in there. Can I please request um, you to go on mute if you're not asking a question or speaking? That would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, so, um, so that's that. And uh, with the hard systems view, you know, the, the efforts are, um, you know, directed at modeling the real world in order to understand it. Uh, while the soft systems view focuses on modeling the cognitive world. Okay, it's not just about the real world, but uh, the emphasis is more on the cognitive world. Okay. So when you talk about systems thinking, you know, obviously it's two words, you know, so the hard systems view emphasize on the systems. Okay. So from a philosophical perspective, you understand the difference between the ontological and epistemological perspectives. The ontological perspectives believes that, you know, the world is there. Now we, we need to describe, you know, what the world is like, right? The epistemological view is more focused on um, how we understand the world, okay? So it's not about the world itself, but rather the focus is on how we understand it. So the, the hard systems view is focused more on the, the epistemological side, you know, which is emphasizing on the systems side of the systems thinking. And the soft systems is more focused on the thinking side of the systems. Yeah. Um, and the focus of the hard systems view is to produce products, solutions, etc., for complex problems. So for example, you know, if you want to design something like a complex, um, you know, a defense, um, a missile defense system, or, you know, if you want to uh, create something, um, you know, uh, of a very complex engineering uh, system, uh, then the, you would lean more towards the hard systems approach. Um, while if you are focused more on, um, the soft systems approach is not about products and solutions. Well, products and solutions can come out of it, but its primary focus is on generating learnings, insights, and greater understanding. Okay. Let me stop there and um, you know check with you guys if you have any questions at this point. Um, do you understand what we're talking about here? Um, are there any concerns or questions? Is anything too controversial? Joe, I have a question. Yeah, yeah sure. So earlier you started with the heart system. It did, did not work well for you. And then you found the soft system view. So are you advocating for us to move into the soft system view? Not necessarily that way. You know, so heart systems has its own areas of application. Right, so, um, so if you look at, um, you know, uh, this slide here, you know, as you can see, uh, hard systems is more leaning towards, you know, mathematical, uh, algorithmic uh, definitions of things. Uh, it's complex problems and solving complex problems in the real world. And where it shines is, you know, uh, when people are not involved, you know, uh, in the systems that you're talking about, um, it, it can be a good effective method. Um, but where it involves people, um, you know, I would lean more towards the soft systems. Yeah. Uh, lean towards that side. So that's the kind of distinction that I'm making. Uh, personally, from an application perspective, um, I, I'm, I'm not an expert. I would have to admit that I'm not an expert on hard systems. You know? So if you ask me about complex numbers and, uh, you know, um, dealing with, uh, uh, you know, uh, the cybernetics and AI kind of related things, you know, I, I'm not such an expert on that. And there's a lot of uh, complexity science that kind of overlaps in those areas as well. Um, my um, area of specialization is more towards soft systems. Yeah, so because I work a lot with people, transformation, and you know, um, reconciling different perspectives and 
um, you know, achieving shared mental models, etc. So if your problems are in that domain, um, you know, it can be professional in a professional environment, or it can be a very personal as well, right? In your family, your own your personal life, solving your own problems, right? Your your own mental conflicts and emotions and stuff like that um, is where soft systems approach really shines. Does it make sense? Oh. We have one more question here from Eric. I think very interesting. Which side would a new process fall? Can you clarify that a little bit, Eric? You know, when we say a new process, what do we mean by that? Um, yeah, I'm thinking. You know, I'm thinking. You know, a new way of doing things. It could be. It could be even behavioral. I mean, I write process there, but it could be new behaviors too. Yeah, and so, and so, specifically the. The example I'm thinking of is is kind of collaboration between two functions in an organization. Absolutely, I would say you know if it involves people, yeah, go towards the soft systems. Soft systems is better. Uh, but let's go. There's a lot more nuance to this. Yeah, so let's kind of get into it. Uh, this is just at a high level, okay? But you would start understanding this once we do a few hands-on exercises. Um, Okay, so moving on. Activity one. Okay, since we are doing this as a virtual exercise, you know, um, I would want you to imagine that you are seeing a real tree here. Okay, so this is a tree, and you're seeing a real tree here. Okay, um, and this is how we, you know, in scientific literature, they talk about how we perceive real world objects. So if you're looking at this tree, at the moment, this is what is happening, okay? So there is one, two, and three, okay? So this is an activity. So let's go back to Paul EV again. And let me activate the next poll. So there are three trees here, right? One, two, and three. You know, the one is the tree in the real world. Number two is the tree or the image of the tree that falls on your retina. And then number three is the image of the tree um, as seen by your brain, okay? Now, the question here is, the poll is about what are you actually seeing here? Right, this is the real tree, it's option A. The one on your retina is option B. The one that your brain is looking at, C, okay. And we see some more responses. We are about 100% right now, let's see. All right, okay. So people who answered A, you guys have fallen the uh, hard systems <laughs> view of the world. Um, and, um, and B and C, C is more towards the soft systems view. Uh, but let me kind of clarify that, you know, what we are actually, the point of this exercise is um, to, kind of illustrate the fact that the world uh, as we see it is primarily a construction or a fabrication, uh, you know, that is done by our brain, okay? Um, it, it is not, okay, so at least the soft systems view says that. It's not the object that exists here. The evidence for that is, you know, if there is no light, for example, you wouldn't see this tree, right? And you, know, you, you are not directly perceiving that object. You are dependent on your eyes. So if you shut your eyes, um, then you can't see it. So obviously there is a visual apparatus involved, there is light involved. So if your eyes are closed or if there is complete darkness, okay, you're not able to perceive the tree. So which means that obviously, you know, irrespective of the tree being there, you wouldn't be able to see it. 
The second possibility is, you know, I might be seeing what is directly falling uh, in the retina of my eye. If that's the case, you would be seeing an inverted image. Uh, and note that there is a blind spot here. So your retina is not continuous. There is, a, there is an area, uh, you know, which is the blind spot, you know, which, you know, technically, uh, whenever we see something, you know, there should be a, a disc shaped black spot, you know, everywhere that we see because of that blind spot. The reason why you don't see the blind spot in spite of it being there is that the brain processes it, you know, so it hides the blind spot. You know? So uh, there are some exercises though through which you can actually perceive the existence of the blind spot. So if you go to YouTube and kind of uh, do the, uh, or just go to Google and search for blind spot perception and life science activity, uh, you know, it will show you an exercise by which you can actually understand, yes, there is a blind spot, okay? Um, but if you're not convinced, let's do this exercise, you know, so, um, <laughs> yes, I can see, I mean, that's just dropping off, no worries. Okay, so um, let's look at, um, you know, so this exercise is, um, you know, to further, uh, you know, create an evidence for that right in this session, right? Um, so look at the red dot uh, on this image for 30 seconds, right? And at the end of the 30 seconds, don't blink while you're looking at it. You know, if you blink, you have to start again. Um, so uh, we'll spend 30 seconds looking at that spot. And then at the end of the 30 seconds, uh, I'll let you know when the 30 seconds is over. And then you can actually look at the white screen and blink five times. Okay, and you can let me know what you see. All right. Okay, so your time starts now. Can you stop and start blinking your eyes and look at the white area of the screen and blink, blink your eyes five times perhaps. Um, okay, so can you, can someone share their experience? What did you see? Did you see anything at all? Just the white yeah. screen? I saw Janice Joplin. <laughs> okay, all right, who, who else? I saw a man on you know the inverted thing. So everything that is white here was black. And yeah, so yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It is supposed to have been Michael Jackson. If you saw Janice Jackson, you were close. <laughs> but um, yeah, so so what does that tell you? You know, is there a photo of Michael Jackson on the white area of the screen? No, you know, but in spite of that, you're seeing it. That's because of, you know, we're just playing with the, with the, you know, intensity of light that's coming in and making an impression in your retina. But then, you know, there is nothing here, which is actually the image of Michael Jackson, right? But then when you look away and blink your eyes, you're able to see it because that's what your brain is showing you, okay? So it's really the image of whatever that you see is, you know, is what your brain is actually fabricating, right? So uh, if your brain of a specific area of the brain that's uh, responsible for, um, you know, the visual uh, faculty shuts off, you can't see anything, right? So that's why sometimes, you know, you get a hit in the head and people go blind. Um, so essentially the world that we see is a construct of the brain, you know, is, is what this exercise is about. And, you know, I would be remiss if I did not give you a warning 
when we go into the next slide. <laughs> um, you know, I'm glad that so many of you took the red pill and attended the session. But essentially, you know, next, next slide, you know, your perspective of the world is going to change so much, at least from a conceptual point of view. So I thought I'd give you a quick warning. <laughs> uh, you still take, can take the blue pill and uh, go back to the old world. But let's go in here. Okay, so the first insight, you know, from a soft systems perspective is that the world you see is not real. The world that you take for granted is not real. Okay, the world you, you hear and sense uh, are made of cognitive structures that are fabricated by your brain. So the evidence for that is if, if you go into a virtual reality room, you go into this uh, plank exercise, uh, you know, that's kind of, um, you know, indicates um, really that the world that we perceive, you know, you can see the expressions uh, of, the, of the person on the left-hand side, you know, she actually thinks that she's walking on a plank, you know, um, on a skyscraper, somewhere at the top of the skyscraper, but actually what's going on is she's actually walking uh, in the studio, right? So um, it kind of, you know, even if you haven't experienced something like this, um, you can really understand, you know, where I'm going with this analogy. So, you know, what you see is basically the fabrication that's happening in your brain uh, based on the external stimuli that it receives. Okay. Um, can anyone else come up with another example of this phenomenon? Have you experienced anything, you know, which makes you feel that what you're experiencing is probably not real? Any other examples? How about dream? Okay, so you could be sitting in the room and then you could go off on a dose, you could, you could doze away and uh, you would be in a completely different world while reality keeps happening, right? So it's the brain that's fabricating it. And, and that is the case when you're awake as well. Okay. So that's the first insight. So what does that mean for us? Okay, so the first concept therefore is that of reality bias, you know, where we say the world, you know, in general uh, terms, the way we think is that you know, I see reality, you know, that's how you think about it. While in, in um, the soft systems perspective, you know, uh, it's more about how you see reality through your cognitive structures. You make that distinction, okay? When you fail to make that distinction, then we talk about, you know, what is called as reality bias. So, which means that you are feeling completely immersed and you're not able to see the distinction between the cognitive structures that are being fabricated uh, you know, in your brain versus the actual real world, okay? Um, so this perspective here, you know, we say the complexity is out there, you know, and you don't have any control of it, you know? So um, to make sense of the real world, you have to map the real world. So, I mean, there is reality to both, you know, there's practical use for both, right? But in this case, what you're saying is complexity lurks within your mental constructs. Okay, so it's important for you to recognize that in order for you to be able to solve complex problems. You know? And if you're able to tune into the right perspectives um, and the, you know, adopt the right mental models, all complex problems can be solved. Okay, so that takes us to the next activity, you know, which is about um, the image that you see here, um, there's an activity, so you can go back to poll. I'll activate that poll in a moment. But look at what's going on here, you know? So there are two pilots, you know, they are uh, flying a plane and you can see, uh, you know, they're talking, they're saying, one of them is saying, say, what's a mountain goat doing way up here in the cloud back? All right, so. With that, let's open the next poll. 
So what seems to be the problem here? And so this is basically an open um, topic for discussion. What seems to be going on here? <clears throat> can you, yeah, you can type in. Uh, it's a free form typing question. So what seems to be going on here? I think in the poll, it has not refreshed. It still is on the which Ah, thing. OK. So yeah, I didn't pick the part. Oh. It should be yeah, should come up now. Sorry. Now, yes. Awesome. <laughs> They're flying too low. That's right. <clears throat> they're going to crash on a mountain exactly yeah but they haven't realized it <laughs> they need wipers yeah they probably need wipers for their mental models yeah so they are thinking that they are flying so high but then the reality is that they are flying straight towards the mountain and you know and they're confused and they see a goat sitting there right so um so so that kind of takes us thanks thanks for your responses so we'll go back to the presentation and so that takes us to the next insight okay so the next insight is that not recognizing that you're seeing your mental models has real consequences in real world. Okay, so that's the next insight. And so a practical application of that, you know, so not such a dangerous situation, but in real world, you know, you in many uh, instances when you walk into a new organization, uh, maybe some an organization that you joined, or uh, you might be visiting your client, um, and you can see, you know, your conceptual mental model is you know, looks somewhere somewhat like this. You know, you have the top guy, the CEO, and then you have, um, you know, other execs, and then you have the middle management and a whole lot of others. Um, uh, so this is how we kind of, it's we go in with such a simplistic model of what that organization looks like. Uh, but in reality, little do we know that this is probably what is happening, right, you know? and. You know, this is how work gets done in most organizations, and, you know, because of relationships and connections, because of, you know, various forms of, uh, um, uh, you know, interactions that people have uh, with each other, you know. So if you just, for a moment, remove that hierarchical structure entirely, you know, in your mind, if you can just take that away, how different does the image on the right look from the one on, the, on your left, right? So it's, it's considerably different. And really, you know, in order for you to get your work done in, 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 within an organization, you need to have a better insight of really what is going on. And you need to tune your mental model uh, to understand, you know, what's happening, right? And that only can happen with experience, with, with information, with, uh, by talking to people and getting different perspectives, et cetera, okay? So that takes us to our concept too, that systems thinking, therefore, you know, so remember when we start, we start with a very generic definition that systems thinking is a worldview where we see the world as being uh, connected together, but, you know, uh, and not made of discrete parts, but, we are going into a bit more nuanced definition here. Now we're going to say that systems thinking is a process of learning where you are trying to align your mental models to the reality, okay? And you do that through a feedback cycle, okay? So systems thinking, therefore, you know, we kind of pivoted from our original definition. Now it is a process and it's a process of learning, okay? And uh, to what end? so that we can navigate reality better. And how do we do that? By constantly learning and, um, and getting feedback from the real world and constantly and consciously refining our mental models as we go. Okay. 
Does it make sense? Let me just take a pause here and see if there are any questions in the chat. Okay, doing the other microphone. is off. Okay. <laughs> and my boss stays in a perfect world. Exactly. <laughs> All right, any, any questions that anyone wants to ask at this point before we get into the next insight? Okay, so let me move on. Um, so the next insight is that you can never not do systems. All right, so I'm not saying you can never do, but you can never not do systems. Thinking. The reason for that is systems thinking, at least from the soft systems perspective is an emerging property of life itself, of, of cognition itself, okay? So if you are aware of things around you, um, or it doesn't have to be even around you, right? Even if you close your eyes and if you feel that you're aware, you're already in the systems thinking mode uh, according to soft systems. I'll explain that um, subsequently, but this is another insight, right? But what we do with systems thinking you know, as a formal discipline is about developing metacognition. It's not about systems. It's not just about thinking itself, but it's about thinking about thinking, okay? Thinking about how these cognitive structures are formed and what are the cognitive structures that are formed, not being unconscious about, you know, how these mental models are shaped, okay? And becoming really conscious of what it is. Okay, so why do I have all these images of different things. So it's, this is what system thinking is doing to your cognitive process. It gives you a telescope, it gives you a microscope, it gives you a video camera, it gives you a playback device and it's in which you can play back, you know, what's really going on in your head. And if you don't like it, it gives you the power to edit as well, okay? So that's another definition of systems thinking. So it's not just about thinking, it's not just about understanding it, it's also about being able to alter it, try different perspectives, try different filters, you know? So that's another layer on top of the previous definitions. Any, any questions, feel free to ask the question if you, if you have any, um, be happy to respond. So insight four is, that you know, it's kind of uh, something that we covered, you know, but it's another not an analogy. So, like what the slide says is like how a potter spins up uh, his potter's wheel and works with the clay to create his pot. So does our cognitive structures weave the reality that we live. Okay. So it's we make up these structures, okay? and we do that. Um, and assume that you have, you know, uh, this potter knows only to make one kind of pot, okay? Uh, he makes the same pot every single time, you know? So if, if you ask him to make something else, he doesn't know because he knows only one way to spin, okay? But with systems thinking, what we are trying to learn is, you know, what can we do out of this reality, right? You know, the, the pot, the clay, the, the, the wheel, everything is the same, but can you apply different skills, different ways of shaping this clay, this clay to different objects? Um, so that's what systems thinking is about. And when you don't have enough skills, um, um, you know, you end up creating things that looks a bit messy and, you know, you feel like life is too bad um, or it doesn't, you know, turn out the way you hoped it would. But when you are more skilled, and you know, when you develop those skills, um, you can create many useful, uh, productive, and beautiful things in the world. Um, so that's that's another insight. Okay. Uh, I'll pause for any comments. I can see uh, Honita has said that well, that's also the power of storytelling. When you decide to shape your story, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it is the story that we tell ourselves, you know, and that's one way of shaping our cognitive structures. 
Any any other perspectives, viewpoints at this juncture? Anything that any insights that you want to share? Any comments? I'll give a pause for ten seconds. Uh, yes, I have a comment. Uh, so this sure. reminds me of of the the world switching from classical thinking in physics into quantum thinking in physics and how mm -hmm. that meant, you know, we had to really rethink our systems, our mental models of classical reality versus quantum reality. And uh, sometimes, you know, we ended up with twisted thoughts, which didn't make sense, but there are physicists who practice their art and, and they make sense of their world. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. So I'm not, too familiar with, um, yeah, I am overall familiar with quantum physics, but, you know, um, yeah, I'm no expert, but, you know, definitely make, you know, it's something that resonates to the sport, yeah. Makes sense. Any other comments from anyone? Thanks, Anika. Yes, so next step is, application on it, I can see a question, you know, how do we now translate all this into real world application, okay? Now, that's where the concept four comes in, you know, which is called as the core mapping, okay? So here we understand what our cognitive structures are made of so that we can then start tinkering with it, okay? So, um, and, and, you know, and, and try to visualize, you know, what it looks like. Okay, and once you start visualizing it, then you also have the ability to, you know, investigate it, um, you know, dive deep into it, change a few things, and, you know, put different filters on it. So you can do a whole lot of things to create different things, right? So um, the concept four talks about core mapping. When, when we say core, you know, it's made of two different things, two different words there. It's an abbreviation. Core stands for cognitive objects and relationships, okay? So uh, the whole of the cognitive structures are made of only two things, right? This actually, you know, I have to uh, say that it comes from one of the um, Cornell University professor um, called uh, Derek Cabrera, uh, but he talks about it in terms of four, four things, you know, kind of simplified it a little bit from there. He talks about it as DSRP, uh, which I've simplified um, and made it easier for people to understand. And in different workshops that I run, uh, people seem to relate more towards you know, what we've said here. So cognitive objects are impressions of real objects, <clears throat> imaginary objects, ideas, concepts, feelings, emotions, colors, and all kinds of you know cognitive things uh, that exist. Relationships. There are two kinds. One is a part-whole relationship, and all other kinds of relationship. Okay, so we, we give some special importance to part-whole relationship because it helps us to visualize uh, better. You know, when you call out those relationships separately, and all other kinds of relationships are you know something that we express in a certain way. Okay. So it's important to understand these concepts. Okay. Any, any questions at this point? Okay, in the interest of time, let me move on. Um, if you have any questions, like I said before, you know, feel free to stop me and ask. Okay. So we will get into the next activity. So this requires you to go into a uh, app called Plectica. So I did give the link to Plectica earlier. Um, what I will do is I will paste this in the chat. Um, so you can actually click on that and get in there. Um, you would need to sign up. You can use your Google, Microsoft, or two different types of accounts to get in and sign up. It requires no credit card or payment details. So you'll be instantly in as soon as you sign up. Um, and uh, yeah, so let me just bring up what it looks like. Okay, so I can see some of you are already here. Um, Raj Shiva is in. Um, others, let me, yeah, I can see a few others are in. Okay, so this is an exercise and 
Are you guys able to see the image that is there? Awesome. Okay, so let me just uh, give you a demonstration of some fundamental things within Practica. So this is a cognitive mapping tool that we will use. This is not the only tool that exists, but you know this is one that I like and I use a lot. So if you double click anywhere here, you create a card, then a card here that presents the cognitive object. Okay. So for example, I'm going to create a cognitive object called as a light pole. Okay. All right, can you see it? So, and I can see that a light pole has a light. Um, maybe a light globe, okay? And so I've created another object called the light globe, okay? Now I want to show that a light globe is part of the light pole, okay? So I'm just, that's how I'm making sense of it in my head, right? You know, you might make a different sense of it. Uh, you might call it as two separate objects, but to me, it looks like the light globe is on the light pole, so I'm just, dragging that so it was out before I've dragged it on top of it and placed it there. Okay. Um, I can also you know just hover over this box here and click on more actions, go to layout and choose a freehand layout which will enable me to move things uh, freely within this object. Okay so what I've done is a very simple thing. Okay you have a light pole you have a light globe, two objects, two cognitive objects, and I've created a part hole relationship. Okay, so to me, the light globe is part of the light pole. Now, I'm also going to create um, something called as a street, as an object. So that also is a cognitive object. Now, I'm going to say that um, uh, the light pole. Uh, is related to the street because I click on that. So I've created a relationship there and I double click that relationship. Then I can say how it is related. Okay, so I'm gonna say uh, it stands on the street. Okay. Yeah, something very simple. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be anything, okay. Um, this is basically how you map your parts. This is how you do cognitive mapping or core mapping. Okay. Now, the exercise here is I'll give another five minutes. Uh, we don't have much time. So I'll give about four and a half minutes um, to, for you to play around and identify more objects and um, create more relationship. You know, it's a joint exercise. Um, so feel free to jump in and play with it. Are you guys able to delete, I mean, uh, edit it? You don't have any problems editing, right? Oh yeah, I can see someone has put a bus there. Awesome. And you want to draw a relationship between bus and anything? So it's up to you guys, okay? Let's see what comes out of it at the end of four minutes. Doesn't have to be perfect. You can just play around. You know, it's, it's your own. You're just mapping your own uh, in your own way. There is no right or wrong in this. So play around with it. Uh, how do you get the boxes? Just double click, branch. So just double click anywhere and you open the box. So 
So it's uh, it's interesting that you know we are now creating a collective cognitive map. So this is the mental model that, as a collective, you know, we're able to create. We can do something very similar in any group, okay? But we can also do it by ourselves, you know? So this is something that we can go, uh, go away and do it for any scenario. So there's nothing special about this image. Um, so we just um, picked a random image and we are looking at it. All of us are looking at it and we are drawing different perspectives. Um, you know, uh, drawing the cognitive reality as we experience it. Yeah. Excellent. So I'll leave it on for you guys to play around. You know, but, um, but since we are um, running very close to end of our time, you know, let me give you some homework. Okay. Um, homework one is map Newton's laws of motion. So if you are into physics, and this is something that we all study, right? So I thought it would be an interesting exercise. Do a system map of Newton's laws of motion. You could map, you know, there are three basic laws of motion. You could do anything, right? An action, direction, people in opposite, or whatever. Or you can choose something entirely different and more interesting and relevant for you. Okay? Any simple formula or principle uh, that you are fond of and that you tend to apply a lot. So do a system mapping of that. Um, use Plectica or just use paper and pencil and draw that, you know, you know the basic principles and you know how to work with it. Uh, <clears throat> just do a core map of that. The other thing that you might do to flex your muscles <laughs> or cognitive, um, you know, uh, core mapping muscles is, uh, you know, think about your next week, okay? And think about a few objectives that you need to meet in the next week and how you would navigate your next week um to to meet those objectives right uh, <clears throat> that's um one way of doing it you know so that's another possible application third is more interesting you know um so everyone has some form of conflict you know it seems to be the norm these days uh, at all levels um uh, let's try and understand what this conflict is about you know, try to map you know the other person what he might be thinking, what you are thinking, you know, and where there, there is disconnect. Um, generally, you know, we are we think about it uh, colored with so much emotions, but try and think more objectively and create a system. Okay. So that's those are three exercises for you to work on, you know, um, by yourself. You, you can use Plectica if you want. It allows you to add up to 250 cards. Um, so you can pretty much work on uh, as many, um, you know, if you uh, are within the limit. If you are exceeding the limit, then you can delete some and, uh, you know, add more cards. Um, and I think if you are a student, it allows you to create an account for $3 every month. Okay, so it's relatively less expensive. So if you're inclined to do that, do that. Next steps, you know, I'm going to start the feedback um, very soon. I would definitely like to hear what you thought about the session. Um, and, you know, the homework, you know, if, if we have to have some kind of a logical feedback loop to this, um, you know, please join the systemic group in workplace. Um, you know, so this is a place where we would, um, you know, continue to discuss and I would. Uh, plan for events and sessions around system thinking. Uh, I would also bring in some guests uh, from time to time to talk about on this topic. And um, uh, there is a group external to our workplace as well on Beaver Cafe. So uh, Abby, who joined, was here in the session before. You know, it's his uh, baby. This uh, the Beaver uh, Cafe is his uh, social network inside. Uh, so he's kindly offered to create a group there. So this group is going to mirror what's in workplace, but it will have participation from external people as well. So if we want to, I have a lot of friends uh, externally, and if you want to bring any of your colleagues or friends uh, who's outside the Stanford Lead community and you want to be part of this group, you know, you can definitely bring them over to us. So I would request you to join these two groups. Uh, it's very simple to join. The links are here. Let me paste these links um yeah joe maybe 
it would be good yeah. if you can also add these links on the workspace, on yeah. the workplace, sorry. And uh, yes, and this, this will be available there too. Yeah, absolutely. So workplace, and then this is Viva Cafe. This yes. Is well, okay. thank you. Thank you. That was that was a great session, Joe. People, okay. there is the poll uh, for Joe, and um, I, I think it was it was a fantastic session that showed us, you know, how we how we are deceived by our own brains and how we can help it, how we can be more critical in our thinking and better understand ourselves and make better decisions. Uh, so in the meantime, when Joe is collecting feedback, I would like to uh, invite you for, uh, you know, to be present uh, either if you are here in person uh, tomorrow at Stanford GSB or, uh, be, uh, or participate in our webinar. Uh, if you are here uh, in Stanford, please make sure that you register for the afternoon session and that you select the one that you that you would like to participate. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you Stanford team for support. Joe, anything else? Uh, did you collect the feedback? Um, yes, so um, I posted the feedback link um, mm -hmm. and I can see some people uh, we have entered feedback. So yeah, I mean, I'm very keen to hear what you have to say about yeah. what you heard today. And uh, I hope to see you guys in the workplace and continue interacting. And we will have a session to go through your homework, you know, if you're so inclined to do. So yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you for awesome. another great day. Thank you. Fantastic. Cheers.